welcome. My name is Lisa Lavallo Sepos, and I'm pleased to introduce Mauro FGN, author of the new book, 2030, How Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Reshape the Future of Everything. Mauro is one of the most original thinkers at the Wharton School, where he holds a Zanman professorship in international management and teaches in its flagship advanced management program and many other courses for executives, MBAs, and undergraduates. An expert on global market trends, he is a sought-after speaker and consultant. He combines his training as a sociologist at Yale and as a business economist in his native Spain to met methodically identify and quantify the most promising opportunities at the intersection of demographic, economic, and technological developments. His research, op-eds, and commentary have been featured in numerous outlets from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal to The Economist and the Financial Times. His book, 2030, How to Today's Biggest Trends Will Collide and Reshape the Future of Everything was an instant Wall Street Journal bestseller. Mara, welcome to Talks at Google. Lisa, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm thrilled to be here. It's so nice to see you again. How is everything? I think everything is fine, uh, more or less, um, you know, knowing that uh, we are, of course, in the middle of a pandemic. But other than that, I cannot complain. Things are going well. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Um, I know that the audience is in for such a treat today. Um, I have firsthand experience with your unique worldview, having taken your classes at the Lauder Institute at UPenn and having worked on a research project that you advised. Um, so we'll take some questions from our viewers towards the end. So anybody watching this in real time, please feel free to submit questions in the live chat throughout our talk. Uh, and also please visit maroguian.com to obtain a copy of his fascinating book in hardcover or audiobook format. Um, Mara, why don't we get started? Um, can you tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book? Yes, so Lisa, I was teaching um, about seven or eight years ago. As you know, I've been at Wharton for 25 years. And by the way, I believe that only Benjamin Franklin has been on campus longer than I have. Uh, but for the longest time, you know, I've been doing research on what's changing in the world and how is that affecting business and technology and so on. And about seven years ago or so, I started to detect uh, that my audiences, uh, my students, were getting anxious about uh, the future, uh, what might happen. And when I uh, uh, spoke publicly in front of uh, conferences or conventions uh, and business leaders, I also detected the same kind of anxiety about it uh, because so many things are changing in the world, population, the rise of emerging markets, technology, and so on and so forth. And I decided uh, to start doing research more systematically about this. And about three years ago, I thought, well, the time has come for a book on this topic. And I wrote 2030. Uh, and again, the, the year is essentially based on my calculations as to when we're going to be in a very, very different situation in terms of consumer markets, financial markets, population trends, the use of technology in the world. And of course, uh, some of the people listening in may be wondering, well, but now there's a pandemic. You know, you did a lot of your research for the book uh, before the pandemic. You published the book in the middle of a pandemic. Well, look, my only regret, uh, Lisa, is that perhaps the book should be called now 2028, because as I'm sure we're going to get into later, uh, this pandemic accelerates many of the trends that I discuss in the book. Yes, um, and I think uh, it's really interesting to see some of the early uh, trends that are accelerating because I think after just eight or nine months of uh, experiencing this in the US at least, we do see some of these trends accelerating, which I'm sure that you'll talk about. Um, it was actually really difficult for me to prepare the talking points uh, for today because it's really hard to know where the story begins when you approach it from a lateral thinking perspective, it's like everything is interconnected and it's um, all about kind of the ability to see around corners and uh, identify where everything is coming together in a way that we don't normally think about. But you do such an expert job in your book of explaining these global trends step by step in a way that reveals just these increasingly complex relationships among seemingly unrelated forces. Can you give our listeners uh, an overview of lateral thinking and how it works? Yeah, so lateral thinking, I think, is the single most important message in the book. Whenever you see so many things out of whack, so many moving parts in the world, again, driven by population trends, driven by what's going on in emerging markets, and driven, of course, by technological innovation, then you really need to not just uh, evaluate trends in isolation, 
of the other trends, meaning one trend at a time. But rather, what you need to do is look for the connections between or among trends. You need to connect the dots, in other words. Lateral thinking is all about looking for you know, the effect in some unrelated part of the world of something that is going on in another part and thinking um, in an integrated way about all of these trends. Let me just give you a very quick example, which I cover in the book. Um, look, with the demise of the, or the phasing out of the one-child policy in China, we are expecting uh, a little bit of pent up demand, so to speak, meaning that uh, maybe the number of babies will grow uh, in the next few months. But over the long run, that's not expected to happen. Now, if that's uh, the case that, uh, you know, in China, things continue to evolve in such a way that families or women, to be more precise, have fewer and fewer children over time. Right now, they're at a level of about 1.7 per, uh, per woman, uh, children over their lifetimes. Then what we're going to see is that there's going to be changes in other parts of the world as well, not just in China, right? And the first connection that we should make is in terms of something that China exports to the United States in addition to all of those gadgets. It's also savings. They export a lot of savings. And if you remember, the one-child policy was responsible for a higher level of savings in China because of the gender imbalance. Having 20% more boys than girls in the country essentially meant that there was a lot of competition in the marriage market. And therefore, then families would save more money in order to make their single boys more attractive in that market. So in the example that I've just uh, been telling you about, you see five or six different trends, how they come together to produce something that at the end we know as the highly indebted American consumer. And all of that goes back, believe it or not, to the one-child policy in China. That's incredible. And to a lot of people, it might seem like the butterfly effect. Um, but one thing that I just remember from your classes and from the many conversations that we've had throughout the years is you always have a way to explain how everything goes through um, this connected life cycle. And um, it's almost like it leapfrogs, leapfrogs continents and it leapfrogs technological developments. And I always just found that so fascinating. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit more now about the changing demographics in different regions of the world and the impact that, that they have on how we think about products and services. Um, what are some of the most significant demographic changes underfoot? Yeah, so that's, um, uh, Lisa, precisely the first step in my methodology in terms of trying to understand what the future might bring. So I call it following the babies. Um, it's a very good way of trying to anticipate what may happen in markets, what may happen with technological development as well around the world. Because those babies that are being born today or will be born in the next few years will be the consumers in the future. Uh, so their numbers, uh, also what happens to them in terms of their educational levels, and needless to say, how much money they end up having in their pockets will have essentially a great impact on the future. So just to summarize here, at a very high level, the most important things that we're seeing in the world right now is that fertility is declining. And by the way, the pandemic accelerates that because obviously people postpone having babies when they see that there is a lot of uncertainty or perhaps if they lose their jobs. But that decline in fertility is not happening at the same time and it is not proceeding from the same level. So in some parts of the world, most notably Sub-Saharan Africa, still families or women tend to have more children than in other parts of the world. So what we're gonna see is three massive changes. Change number one is the centers of gravity in population, of population in the world are going to shift away from East Asia and towards South Asia, especially India, and also from Europe towards Sub-Saharan Africa. Here in the United States, Latin America, Australia, New Zealand, the changes are not going to be as dramatic as those other parts of the world. So dramatic reconfiguration of the centers of gravity of population in the world, number one. Number two is what happens to the younger age group. And we're going to see three types of countries. China is going to have fewer young people uh, by the year 2030. In fact, they're going to have 60 million fewer young consumers by the year 2030 compared to what they have today. India or Indonesia or Bangladesh or so many other countries in the world, Nigeria and so on, they're going to have more people in that age group over the next 10 years. And then here in the United States, we're going to have about the same number. Uh, it's a round number, 90 million people between the ages of 15 and 35 in the year 2030, roughly speaking, the same number as we have today. But here we see another big demographic change, of course. More than half of those young consumers in the year 2030 here in the United States are going to be what today we call minorities, African-Americans, Hispanics, 
is um, Asian Americans and so on. And then last change, and I'm sure you're going to have a lot of follow-up questions about it. Population above age 60. By the year 2030, people above the age of 60 are going to be the largest segment of the market in the world. And this is happening in every country. Every country will have more people above the age of 60 by the year 2030. So it's really important if you're thinking about technology, if you're thinking about new products or new services, to start thinking about the senior consumer. I call it in the book, the gray consumer. Um, yeah, that's right. And um, the gray consumer um, also has a gray wallet and they ha they need uh, certain uh, gray uh, services and products. And I think it's has a ton of potential for us to um, serve them with new technologies. We see them increasingly comfortable with um, kind of the everyday technologies that we're familiar with and cell phones and computers and everything. Um, but I'm not sure yet that we're developing necessarily with that consumer in mind. Um, and this might be a good area where we could consider some leapfrog technologies, which you do talk about of technology has this opportunity to um, make its way to a new segment of the population or to, to solve a new use case in a way that doesn't necessarily wait for it to follow the nice linear path that a piece of technology might have followed um, in let's say the US uh, when it first came to market. Um, and you talk about this in terms of Africa and mobile payments, for instance. Um, are there um, things that we should consider for the gray market um, that we, uh, might not have top of mind, but that could be repurposing existing technologies in new ways? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and let me just, before I give you some specific examples, clarify a couple of things that are really important about the segment, this consumer segment that is emerging, that is growing so fast in the world of the population above the age of 60. The first very important point is that, you know, once people reach uh, the age of 60 these days, uh, they can expect to live on average another 25 years. And more so if we're talking about women as opposed to men. That's a lifetime, right? So this consumer, second point also, is going to be in much better physical and mental shape than a 60-year-old or a 70-year-old 50 years ago when you and I were growing up, or at least I was growing up. So here's the thing. That demographic now, it's going to be the largest. And it's also going to be people who are going to be thinking about spending their time, perhaps working part-time, perhaps having leisure, perhaps retiring. And they're going to need certain kinds of technologies that I don't think we have developed fully yet, right? So let me give you two or three examples. First is they're going to be really interested in hybrid arrangements because when you're expected to live another 25 years, maybe you don't want to spend them in retirement, but you would like to engage in some gig work. Uh, let's not forget people in their 60s, people in their 70s, they have experience, they have accumulated a lot of knowledge. And maybe, maybe they would like to continue using that knowledge if only on a part-time basis, because they also want to have some fun. So that's one area in which I think we need to develop new platforms, new technologies, uh, new opportunities for that demographic to continue making contributions to society and to the economy and not just think about them as retirees. Second area, robotics and automation for the home. Well, sooner or later, people start declining physically and maybe they need help. For example, lifting the shopping bag from the floor in their kitchen to the countertop. Uh, or perhaps uh, they will need robotics to uh, for other uh, purposes, right? Um, also, they will need companionship. Um, so voice recognition technology may come handy, right? So there's all sorts of things that once this demographic, uh, you know, feels more comfortable about technology, I think, will become so much more widely used. And then lastly, I want to bring to your attention another area that is very important. Once people in that demographic uh, start declining cognitively, they can become subject to one of the most common crimes here in the United States and in other countries as well, as well which is financial abuse of the elderly, right? And uh, as you know, this is a problem that we can measure in the billions of dollars every year. So I think also the time has come to help people in that situation and their family members and their loved ones to cope with this problem. And let me remind everyone that most of the time, 
the crime of uh, abusing the elderly financially is perpetrated by family members, by caregivers, or by neighbors, because they know what the situation is. They know what the weaknesses are. They know where the money might be. So I think that's another area in which technology can play a, can play a huge role, right, in terms of helping us minimize that threat. So I could give you so many more examples about, uh, uh, you know, the gray market, about uh, what are the opportunities with technology in it. The book contains dozens of examples. And of course, I will be very happy to answer questions from the audience about that particular aspect of technology development. Great, thank you. Um, another thing that strikes me about um, an aging population is the need for healthcare. Um, and one area that um, you do go into in quite a bit of, of detail is immigration and the role that um, immigrants play in our healthcare system, particularly in the US. Um, and this is a bit of a challenging topic to talk about, especially in the US right now, because it can be a little bit of contentious. But um, maybe can you talk to us a little bit about um, the role of immigration and ensuring that we have the right healthcare in place in the country, that um, we continue to support the areas where um, workers are required, um, but that we might not have a appropriate domestic supply of workers to fill those jobs. Um, I think that would be really helpful for us to understand the data and some of the misunderstandings uh, around immigration, especially to the US. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for bringing this up. I'm sure uh, the people who are uh, listening have realized that I have an accent. So I am an immigrant myself. Uh, but look, uh, I think I can be objective about the numbers. And by the way, all of those trends that you've uh, put together um, represent, I think, a prime example of why we need to think laterally, because all of these things are interconnected. So migration, as you know, is something that tends to attract, for the most part, middle-aged people. So children or people above the age of 60 are very unlikely to migrate by themselves, right? So in other words, one of the first benefits of immigration is that it helps us rebalance the age structure of the population at a time when in many countries around the world, including here in the United States, we're in the midst of a process of population aging. So that's number one. Number two is entrepreneurs tend to be so much more inclined to become entrepreneurs. Your company, right, is one result of uh, immigrant entrepreneurship, but so many others in the Silicon Valley and beyond. Not only that, there's also a lot of small scale entrepreneurs who open a proverbial dry cleaning operation or a restaurant. So entrepreneurship is something that comes together with immigration. And therefore, I think we, not, we need to debunk that myth that immigrants tend to destroy jobs. In fact, they create a lot of jobs, both in small businesses and also in large technology companies, for example, such as Google. Uh, but let me take this uh, one step further, following your lead on the healthcare sector. Here in the United States, between 25 and 35% of the doctors, the nurses, and the clinical technicians that we have in our healthcare system are foreign born. Those are very high percentages, but it gets even higher that percentage when we consider who are the people here in the United States who take care of the elderly in their homes. And that's more than 90%, about 92% are foreign born. So here's um, a very simple projection or forecast on my part. On the one hand, we're having fewer babies, okay? So we're not gonna have grandchildren taking care of grandparents, okay? There's not enough of those grandchildren. In fact, by the year 2030, for the first time in Japan, in China, in the US, in Europe, we're gonna have more grandparents and grandchildren. Just think about that, right? That, that was not the way the world looked like when I was growing up. Now, coupled with that, we have now in many parts of the world restrictions to immigration. So immigration goes in cycles. Sometimes, you know, we accept a lot of immigrants in the destination countries in the world, uh, but then there's a backlash against immigration. So historically, over the last 150 years, we've gone through these cycles of up and down in terms of the willingness of the general public uh, for admitting immigration. Uh, well, if uh, at the same time we have fewer babies and we also have fewer immigrants, then I think the conclusion is very clear, which is that we're going to have to use technology, Lisa. Uh, so I have already realized that when I'm old, maybe let's say 75, 80, 85 years old, I would like to continue living in my home, but I will need help. But I have come to the conclusion that I'm going to have some kind of robotics taking care of me. 
because there's not going to be enough, uh, you know, um, uh, babies being born now to take care of me when I'm old, or there's not going to be enough immigrants. Um, so technology is going to be there in our old age, and it's going to be so much more pervasive, not just robotics and automation, but also virtual reality, an array of technologies. So I think our, um, you know, when we become uh, 70 years old, uh, 80 years old, we're going to be such heavy users of technology. And by the way, the early experiments, as I explained in the book regarding all of this, is that people in that demographic today, they prefer to be taken care of by a robot. And the reason is that the robot never takes a break. And also the robot talks to you using technology, and it only talks to you about the topics that you want to hear about. Uh, and there's so many other advantages. So it's not that robots are going to take over and completely replace human care. But for certain kinds of things, for certain times during the day, I think the future will be one in which we're going to be using technology very, very heavily uh, in the homes of people who are declining physically and cognitively. It's so interesting how we think about the role of uh, caregiving, right? We're saying that this can become a function of robots in the future, but um, if I do take a little bit of a lateral step, um, I think about women because women traditionally hold that role. They're mothers, they're daughters, they're granddaughters, and they do have a traditionally big expectation in society. But um, I pick particularly loved your chapter about women. Uh, it does start off with some impressive stats up front, like women receive the majority of undergraduate and graduate degrees in the United States and more than 40% of American mothers earn more than their husbands. Um, I can attest that it's surely not smooth sailing for women, um, but these do seem like encouraging signs for a more equitable society. Um, but then you do go in to say uh, that they have significant differences in consumption, saving and investment patterns. And I'm wondering how you think that will shape the future and if you can give us um, some more details about uh, what you go into in the book in this area. Ah, uh, yeah, Lisa. So I think this is perhaps the pivotal chapter in the book. It comes halfway through it. Uh, so women's role in society, in the economy, is behind many of the changes that we're seeing. I mean, the decline in the number of babies and fertility has a lot to do, right, or has primarily to do with the new opportunities available to women. And I think that is something that we should welcome and we should celebrate, but it does have consequences. Let me also say very quickly that um, not every woman is doing today better than a generation ago. There's also tremendous inequality. And by the way, that's something that the pandemic is also exacerbating. But you mentioned the 40, 41% of uh, mothers uh, in the United States uh, or um, wives, right? So married women that make more money than their husbands. And by the year 2030, it will be more than half, according to the projections by the US Census Bureau. Globally, my own projection, my own forecast, is that by the year 2030, more than half of the net worth in the world will be owned by women. Now, that doesn't mean that all women will be rich. Once again, there is inequality. There's no question about it. And a lot of it has to do with education. So more educated women do much better in the market. They do much better in life from a financial point of view. But to your question, what are the implications of this? Well, let me just uh, give you three examples. Um, the first one has to do with consumption, the second one with savings, and the third with investing. They all have to do with one underlying difference between men and women that seems to be very resilient to change, which is that women on average tend to be more risk averse than men. And that difference in risk aversion level has a lot of implications in the economy. When it comes to consumption, there's no wonder that when women have money and they have control over their money, then they prefer to spend it on different categories of goods and services when compared to men. Let me give you three examples. Women tend to spend more money on healthcare, especially preventative healthcare. Remember, once again, they're more risk averse. Not just, uh, by the way, spending money on healthcare for themselves to their benefit, but also for their grandparents, for their children, and for their uh, grandchildren. Uh, second is they spend more on education. Again, not just um, to their benefit, but also for, on their children's education and their grandchildren's education. And another one that I really like, insurance. Women prefer to have, for example, lower deductibles when they purchase automobile insurance or home insurance. Well, if you demand a lower deductible, that means the premium goes up. And if the premium goes up, that means you're spending more money on your insurance. So women prefer more comprehensive insurance. 
Uh, now, the second thing, savings. There's also major differences. Women, when they're single and have no plans to get married, they save so much more than men, okay? Now, let me just uh, uh, specify here something very important. The moment then that a man and a woman become engaged and they want to get married, then the man starts saving more money. I think that's because he freaks out. He realizes that he hasn't been saving that much money, but now he's going to have responsibilities. Now, once they get married, then things go back to the original state. Women start um, saving more money, except when there are kids. When there are kids, then the man, the husband, the father tends to spend, I'm sorry, to save more money than the mother. And the reason for that is mothers, unfortunately, tend to spend more time with their children because in addition to working, they also uh, tend to um, um, you know, perform a greater percentage than 50, more than 50% of the household tasks, including taking care of the children. And when you spend too much time with children, I'm sure you're realizing that, Lisa, then there's all sorts of out-of-pocket expenses that take place, right? You need to buy this, you need to buy that. Uh, and then finally, investing. What we also see in every country in the world is that women tend to allocate their savings uh, in a way that um, manages the risk so much more effectively than men. Uh, so we see this in pension fund allocations. Women tend to be more conservative when it comes to investing their money. And by the way, they normally get better long-term returns as a result. Um, but the more interesting thing is, is that there's also some convergence. As men, we see in research, acquire more experience about how investing works, they tend to reduce their level of risk. Uh, and the opposite is true of women. When women acquire more experience about how to manage their money, they tend to increase their level of risk. So you're very good at statistics. This is known as regression to the mean, right? So men and women start at different levels, but then as they go through the same experience of investing their money over time, then they tend to converge, right? So this is the important thing here in everything that I've been saying, which is that men and women are different. We do come from different planets. That's what the you know, bulk of the evidence seems to indicate. However, one cannot assume that women as they pursue those career opportunities will be always very different from men. There's, there's a, a, a certain measure of convergence. There's a measure of change, of evolution in terms of the behavior of men and women as they are exposed to similar experiences. I love that. And I actually, I just pulled up uh, your book here because one of my favorite statements was about um, a study that compared men and women doing trades for an investment bank in New York. They were similar in terms of education and experience. The researchers found that the men traded more frequently and took more risks than the women, and that the women obtained slightly better returns over the long run. Um, and that's something that I've kind of had in the back of my mind, or maybe even the forefront of my mind right now about um, thinking towards the future and you know trying to not make any rash decisions, especially during this moment in which we're living. But um, I'm not sure that everybody thinks that way. Um, so it's just really interesting to, to hear about that study and to see the research behind it, especially as somebody who appreciates statistics. Look, I'm very happy about the results of our research. I have two daughters, so I'm in the best possible situation. I'm very happy. <laughs> um, What's really going to happen, um, especially if we consider the role of women um, in emerging markets? Um, and maybe if we want to think about a little bit of the current pandemic effects. Um, but emerging markets are certainly not the same as the US. Um, they do have the opportunity to have different shifts in their population demographics, um, different leapfrog opportunities with technology. Um, how do some of these trends hold up and how will the pandemic potentially impact them differently? Yeah, that's a great question, Lisa. And once again, I'm going to be using this um, uh, approach of lateral thinking. Uh, so for 20 years now or 25 years, we've known that at some point the emerging markets would become more than half of the uh, global economy and global consumption. And we are approaching precisely that moment in history. I think we're privileged, uh, you know, in a way, in terms of the fact that we're going to see history in the making over the next few years as emerging markets become more than half. Look, the pandemic is affecting different parts of the world uh, to different degrees. Uh, in the parts of the world where they've managed to bring the pandemic under control in terms of the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, and also the number of um, fatalities, uh, then their economies are first not suffering as much 
from the recession. And secondly, they are expected to recover much faster and to resume rapid growth. So as a result, what we're seeing is that East Asia, uh, so China, Vietnam, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, uh, and several other markets, all the way down to the South uh, Pacific uh, area where we have New Zealand, all of those countries, they have managed to bring the pandemic under control, so much more so than in Europe or here in the United States or in Latin America. So those markets are going to surge ahead over the next 18 months. And if uh, we were expecting that in five or six or seven years, East Asia would be the largest region in the world in terms of GDP, then I think that's going to happen a little bit earlier. By contrast, in South Asia, including India, or in Latin America, I think the growth of those uh, emerging markets is going to uh, is not going to be as fast as we thought over the next two or three years, because essentially they have not, uh, you know, succeeded at bringing the pandemic under control. But then, what role the, does technology play in all of this? Well, look, most of these emerging markets they've had one advantage, which is the concept that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, which is leapfrogging, they have been able to adopt the latest technology without having any legacy systems in place. The most extreme case, of course, is Sub-Saharan Africa. You mentioned mobile payments, but we also have mobile health. Uh, we have um, um, digital government, uh, like Ghana is one of the countries in the world that is the most advanced in terms of uh, the digital interaction between citizens and their government. Um, so what we're seeing here is essentially that emerging markets have one key advantage, which is that if they are willing to invest in technology, they can really, you know, like search ahead through this process of leapfrogging by adopting the latest thing without having to go through all of the intermediate stages. And that essentially gives them a, a huge advantage. Think about China, right? It's not Sub-Saharan Africa. Think about China and the um, extent to which they have moved things online to the digital world. Uh, think about uh, the kinds of companies that are emerging there. Um, think about, uh, obviously, the size of the country. And if uh, you have 1.3 billion consumers in your home country that are becoming fully digitized, uh, that certainly gives you quite a bit of an advantage, for example, in a field such as artificial intelligence. So I think what's going on in emerging markets right now is, you know, essentially, you know, uh, a bifurcation. Some of them will be surging ahead, others not so much in the next couple of years because of the pandemic. But in general, emerging markets have a lot of advantages uh, that they can, um, you know, leverage right now. Uh, and, um, you know, I have no doubt that before this decade is over, a little bit before the year 2030, um, emerging markets as a whole in the world uh, will be much bigger uh, in terms of gross domestic product, in terms of the size of the economy, than Europe, the United States, Japan, Canada, all of the mature economies combined. Really fascinating. Um, I would like to just take a quick moment to remind our viewers that we will be taking questions live in just a little bit. So feel free to add your question into the live chat. Um, and maybe I can just move on um, to something that all countries have in common, uh, which is cities. You know, the big metropolitan hubs is where business gets done. It's where people come together. Um, and one area that you really spend a lot of time in your book is in the chapter called Cities Drown First, which sounds very pessimistic, but it's, it's actually quite full of opportunities to think about vertical agriculture and how can we be more efficient with energy um, and um, you know how do we have to really think about urban migration and climate change uh, in the context of the cities that are going to be increasingly um, more dense um, with people um, and uh, maybe we can talk about cities but also this is where you introduce two lateral principles, the mundanity of excellence and nudging. And I think that these are actually really relevant for the technology field. Um, so maybe if you can explain these two principles uh, and tell us a little bit about how cities can employ them to drive the right kind of innovations for the future. Yeah, so this is one of um, the topics in the book that is uh, dearest to my heart, Lisa. Look, uh, cities in the world occupy about 1% of the land. Uh, they are home to about 55% of the population. And by the year 2030, the projection is that they will be home to 65% of the population. 
But cities, as we speak today, they account for about 80% of the carbon emissions in the world. So 1% of the land, 55% of the population, 80% of the carbon emissions, which essentially means that unless we address the problems in cities, it's going to be really hard to tackle the problem of climate change, among many other issues as well. I think technology has a huge role to play, obviously, in two ways. I mean, one is, okay, so breakthroughs in the field of energy. How can we become more energy efficient, right? Developing new energy sources. But then there's a second one where I think that, especially the kinds of digital platforms, the kinds of apps that we have on our phones, can make a big, big difference. And that's in terms of changing our behavior as consumers. And here's where the two principles that you mentioned come in. So the mundanity of excellence and nudging. That is to say, we could deploy technology apps to help us become more efficient consumers, less wasteful. Let me just give you two very simple examples. Here in the United States, we waste about 30, 31% of the food that reaches the end consumer. But we don't share food. We let it go bad, you know, those cans that we forget we have at home. Or we don't use the full bag of uh, some ingredient when we're preparing a dish. Well, there are apps now that are just not very widely used that help us people share food. And it is sharing food with people who need it, but just more broadly sharing food with your neighbors. If you're not going to use the rest of a can because uh, you, didn't, you only needed half of it for some particular recipe, Maybe you could inform other people in your area through an app that uh, that is the case. Another area uh, that contributes a lot to carbon emissions is not just agriculture. For example, another area is clothing. Um, you know, we buy way too many clothes, right? And uh, sometimes we only wear one of them for, you know, a couple of times and then, you know, falls out of fashion and we never use it again. And yes, there are some platforms already where you can share certain types of clothes, run, run the runway comes to mind. But I think we should make a greater effort, right? And I think technology through the sharing or collaborative economy can make us better consumers, more mindful of how we use natural resources, and also in a way that helps us reduce carbon emissions. Because let's not forget agriculture and the transportation associated with moving fertilizers or produce around the world that is the single most important source of carbon emissions. So we can fix our behavior as consumers, making it less wasteful uh, for, in the cases of food, clothing, and several other categories. I think we can go a long way in terms of uh, addressing the problem of climate change. And again, I think technology, I think apps, I think uh, the sharing platforms have a very important role to play. What we need to do is think in terms of uh, the mundanity of excellence, how very small changes in our behavior can go a long way towards uh, overcoming the problem of climate change. And secondly, nudging, uh, introducing incentives that are not monetary, that induce people to do the right thing, to make the right kinds of decisions, to be more environmentally conscious. Great. Um... I think, you know, as people who live and breathe technology every day, sometimes we're so focused on making a huge technological advancement um, and we can lose a little bit of uh, focus on the details that really make everybody's life better and the small um, tweaks here and there and really focus on the excellence and the right um the right incentives, as you say, and nudging folks in the right direction. So um, maybe I'll make this the last question and then we'll go over to the live chat for some questions that are coming in from our listeners. Um, for people, especially at Google, who live and breathe technology every single day, um, in the book you do uh, mention kind of big life cycle, the like not even 10,000 foot view, it's like the million foot view because we go back and we think about technological advancements throughout all of history. Um, where are we at in the technological life cycle right now and where will we be in 2030? Um, I'm, I'm especially interested in the areas of artificial intelligence, automation, VR, um, and how can we think about these things um, and applying them to um, some of the areas that you talk about in the book? Well, Lisa, I think uh, it is no exaggeration to say that we're going through uh, an explosion, right? A huge outburst of creativity and just uh, sheer, you know, um, breakthroughs in terms of technology. And I think the next uh, few years are crucial 
Um, because there's so many ways in which uh, we can allocate the resources that we have to develop new technologies, new applications of those technologies. I think uh, what will be important in the next 10 years is to prioritize, to see what is it that can make the planet more inhabitable? inhabitable? Uh, what is it that will help us uh, arrest uh, the problem of climate change? What is it that will help us reduce inequality, for instance? Um, now, notice that all of these trends, with the only potential exception of climate change, are being accelerated by the pandemic, right? And I mentioned that climate change is not being accelerated by the pandemic in the sense that we're commuting less, right? So we have this phenomenon of remote work. Well, all of these things are going to be more or less attractive to people, depending on whether we can persuade the population that is going to make them better, that is going to you know, help them um, uh, you know, be happier in life. And for those who are at the short end in terms of the rewards, uh, the people who are suffering from inequality, if we can, you know, um, one way or another, using technology to reduce those levels of inequality. I think it's extremely important over the next 10 years to prioritize, right? And at the top of my list, perhaps, would be climate change, because I think we need to throw everything we have, including the kitchen sink, right, on that problem. And so I think we should focus uh, a lot of our technology development efforts. But again, we were talking earlier about the population of age 60 and the fact that, you know, increasingly people are going to live beyond age 70, 75, 80, greater and greater numbers of people. How can we make life for that demographic something that is fun, right? Something that is rewarding so that they can continue to have a lifestyle that uh, has you know, certain, you know, uh, attractive characteristics, such as, for example, a measure of independent living uh, or uh, help them be in communication with their loved ones, even if they are distant. So that's where I think uh, virtual reality may play a very important role. So what I would encourage the people who are listening is to think about what are those key problems in the world, right, that we have? And again, uh, you may focus your attention on climate change or you may focus your attention on making the life of the elderly as good and as rewarding as possible. And then see how different kinds of technologies can help us get there, right? Uh, so reach our goals in terms of uh, overcoming the obstacles and uh, just creating more opportunities and more fun for everyone. Uh, so I do believe, though, that we're going to have to prioritize, right? Because uh, not every technology has the potential of, um, you know, um, making life uh, be much better for everyone or for the largest number of people possible. Uh, and I think that's where both uh, businesses and governments, I think, need to, you know, essentially think about how to allocate resources in the way that generates the greatest value to society. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I think we'll start taking some questions from um, our listeners here. So um, if we could see the first question, please. Um, this question from Anver, what is the one past prediction you have made that you are the most proud of? And what is your biggest miss? Okay. So that's a, uh, that's a great question. And I might say, uh, Avner, that I've never been put on the spot uh, so uh, you know, bluntly. So I'm, I'm very happy to see that. Look, I'm proudest of the uh, prediction uh, that uh, the um, process of globalization, uh, in particular, uh, the process towards uh, financial markets uh, in the world that are very integrated uh, would generate instability in the global system, right, in the global economy. So I'm proudest of that uh, forecast. Now, that doesn't mean that I was able to anticipate the crisis in 2008, which, if you remember, had very uh, clear financial origins. There were very clear financial origins to it. Um, but uh, I am nonetheless, you know, I, I, it's very difficult to predict a particular instance of a crisis, but you can certainly predict that there's going to be instability, right? Uh, just at the general level of instability and uncertainty in the global economy. Now, the one that I uh, completely uh, missed, um, so uh, I think uh, I would say, among many others, since I told you that I've uh, been around for a long time uh, trying to make these predictions, I never anticipated, for example, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, as you know, there's many people who study the world and uh, global geopolitics uh, who would have liked to predict that, but nobody predicted it, even after Chernobyl, even after some of those uh, events. But I think, uh, you know, we all learn from those mistakes as well as from the successes. And uh, let me tell you what I've learned, and it's the single most important thing, which is that 
you have to choose a time horizon over which you're making forecasts that makes sense in the context of the kind of forecasting tools that you have. So in the book, I use this methodology combining um, you know, population trends and uh, projections about the growth of emerging markets. And I feel very comfortable making these days uh, predictions uh, 10 years down the road. And that's why the book, the title is 2030. It just came out. So these are 10 year forecasts into the future. However, if I attempted using the same methodology, if I attempted to make forecasts 20 or 30 years down the road, I think I would be making a lot of mistakes. So I feel very confident using a 10 year time window to make uh, forecasts using this methodology. Uh, so that is for me um, the greatest learning point. Um, so you can make projections into any kind of uh, you know, number of years into the future, but make sure that your methodology enables you to do so. Great, thank you for that. Uh, we have another question here from Matthew. A lot of the research and stats presented are for straight couples and families. Are there any interesting insights for LGBT plus families? Yes, Matthew, so thank you so much for the question. And I was going to uh, make a comment about this uh, when Lisa and I were discussing the differences between men and women. Uh, increasingly, as you know, uh, the number of uh, people who are LGBTQ are playing a very important role in the economy. And of course, we see that attitudes towards that category, right, of gender are shifting, especially among the younger generations. And that these days we also have uh, people who define themselves as being non-binary and in so many other ways, right? So uh, there are, um, of course, certain characteristics of men and women uh, which are biological, having to do, for example, with the rate at which they produce certain proteins or certain enzymes in their bodies and all of that, that have an impact on certain things uh, that um, are important for the future, such as, for example, longevity, right? So regardless of whether women have children or not, they tend to live longer than men because of their biology, right? Uh, so there are certain things uh, that um, you know go with uh, you know the the, the classification uh, of uh, humans uh, between men and women, but in terms of uh, for example some of the other characteristics, uh, I must tell you, Matthew, that I'm working on that right now because the statistics that we have available, for example, in terms of the career paths and in terms of the accumulation of wealth or lack thereof, and also in terms of inequality. Uh, across different categories of uh, people, depending on their sexual orientation, depending on the lifestyle that they would like to pursue in their lifetime, those statistics are still lacking. Uh, we have very little information in some of the surveys that are conducted. And by the way, if you try to get that information for countries other than the European ones or here in the United States or perhaps Canada, it's extremely difficult to find that information for Sub-Saharan Africa, for Asia, uh, needless to say, for Russia, which is, as you know, one of the places in the world uh, where um, uh, sexual orientation is not really, uh, you know, respected, uh, you know, the, the choices that people make in that regard. So I have to tell you that I'm working on that. Uh, but the biggest obstacle that I have in terms of making projections about it is that we still have good or lack. I'm sorry, we still lack good data on that. And it is something that I'm presently working on. I was going to say, it does seem like an area ripe for um, applying lateral thinking and getting to uh, the source of truth behind the data, um, as you say, because um, I don't think there are you know, very robust insights in a way that um, you, we'd be able to present the same trends today. So I'm really glad that you're thinking about it. And I think it will be uh, really insightful um, to bring something like that um, to market. Um, maybe we can go to another question. Great. Um, this one from Sandeep. Uh, insurance companies have their money on the line with regards to insuring properties that will be heavily impacted by climate change. How do you foresee the role of insurance companies? Yeah, well, look, um, if you um, talk to people in the insurance industry or if you check some of the statistics, uh, you will notice that insurance companies are already anticipating that problem. And they're starting to be much more reluctant for example, to ensure a relatively affordable rates, property in areas that can be subject to floods, especially if the risk there is increasing as it is because of climate change. Uh, so there are many issues, I think, uh, that we as a society are gonna have to deal with because insurance companies 
are going to be very reluctant, I think, over the next uh, 20 or 30 years to take on certain risks uh, that they may find are just uh, impossible for them to insure against. Uh, but let me also put on the table for discussion another one uh, that I think is very relevant, at least to some part of your company, of Google or Alphabet, which is how are we going to deal with the consequences, potential consequences, of uh, automated systems in terms of um, you know insurance and in terms of the uh, things that could go wrong? And uh, just consider autom um, um, autonomous vehicles. Um, so just a few days ago, um, I was uh, teaching a class for undergraduates um, that has to do with applications of artificial intelligence. And I'm bringing uh, a different guest speaker every day of class. But during the first day of class last week, I was telling them about uh, the ethical dilemmas involved in autonomous vehicles. What happens you know, when you approach an intersection and uh, you can either spare the life of uh, a 50-year-old, you can spare the life of a 10-year-old, but not both. It's a typical, if you remember, classic trolley problem. Uh, well, there's ethical uh, considerations there, but there's also insurance considerations. So, for example, I think um, insurance companies are incorporating uh, the Internet of Things when it comes to assessing the right kind of rates for different kinds of people, depending on how they use the asset, how they drive, all of these sorts of things. But I think that automation and artificial intelligence more broadly are also going to open up like a, a, a Pandora's box, right, uh, with surprises for insurance companies. So I think that technological change, right, not only climate change, is also going to change, uh, it's also going to transform the insurance industry, both in terms of the kinds of risks that they're going to have to insure, and also in terms of the way in which they're going to be assessing or evaluating those risks. And be mindful of the fact that new technology enables insurance companies to avoid profiling. Because if you remember, for example, they ask men to pay a higher rate of insurance than women, right? Knowing statistically what happens once men versus women get behind the wheel. Uh, but maybe in the future, we can have more behavior-based measures of, uh, of uh, assessing uh, people's behavior and therefore charging them different rates. Now, uh, again, that raises uh, further ethical issues because uh, maybe we would get into a society uh, such as the one that was described uh, by George Orwell in 1984, big brother watching you, how you drive your car. So we're going to have to be very careful about all of this. But uh, I think you've put your finger on, uh, I think, an industry insurance that is going to go through a huge transformation, both because of climate change and also because of technological change and the new kinds of opportunities that technology offers. Thank you. Do you want to go to one more audience question? And then I think um, that should be it. Oh, another one from Sandeep. Great. A perfect follow on for the uh, climate change here. There was a 50 year study on loss of flora and fauna from 1970 to 2020 that published dire numbers. Are you optimistic that there will be change in our relationship to our ecology by 2030? <laughs> Look, Sandeep, that is a really important question. If you remember many, many decades ago, there was a famous book called Silent Spring, which was published. And in it, the author, a woman, uh, told us, look, think about biodiversity very seriously, because if we upset the balance among all of the millions of species that we have on the planet, then that's going to have very, very uh, important consequences. And uh, we're seeing that today. Now, to your the part of the question where you're asking, am I optimistic about the 10, next 10 years in terms of both climate change and biodiversity? And I completely agree with you that uh, our losses in biodiversity are at least as you know, um, important for the future uh, in terms of the consequences that might bring as our inability to deal with climate change right now. So I am, op I am optimistic on, on th in three respects. Uh, so let's see, uh, you know, if uh, I can persuade you about them. So the first is that I do believe that we're getting to the point where green renewable energy sources are becoming competitive. As you know, solar and wind now can, under most circumstances, uh, be better in terms of cost, in terms of efficiency, than coal, which is by far the dirtiest uh, source of energy that we have. Um, number two... I think uh, we have now the technologies, especially the ones that uh, you develop at a company, at your company, that will enable us to engage in the kind of uh, 
micro behavioral uh, you know modification of uh, consumer uh, actions and decisions so that we become less wasteful and we were discussing that if you remember earlier on during this uh, session and then number three I do hope that uh, one of the key learnings from this pandemic is that we need to think again about our relationship as a species, as the human species, with the environment. Because at the end of the day, a public health crisis, such as the one that we're going through, has something to do with the ecology of uh, human beings on the planet. The ecology is all about how a species relates to its environment. And I do believe that we extract the right lessons from this in the sense that we need to redefine how we live our lives, how we use the natural resources at our disposal. So I am optimistic. And um, by the way, Lisa didn't mention this, but the book is very optimistic. Uh, there are all of these changes, there are all of these issues. But I always try to put in every page, I try to put a positive spin on things, trying to turn a challenge or a threat into an opportunity. Uh, so I am very optimistic, but I think we need to act. I, we cannot delay action on both biodiversity and climate change. Thank you so much, Mauro. That was exactly the note that I was going to close on here is that um, this book for me um, is just full of opportunities. Um, and I love the way that you present them with that mindset. I think that's critical as we you know, can maybe sometimes feel a little bit uh, overwhelmed by all of the things going on around us that are out of our control. But to me, I do see so much opportunity in the world ahead of us. Um, and it's a great way to, you know, pull together different trends and find new ways of looking at things that will really have a, a very strong impact in solving uh, the new challenges that we're going to be facing. So thank you so much for that breath of fresh air and bringing that perspective um, to life for us. Um, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Um, so uh, I encourage anybody to reach out to you on LinkedIn if they have uh, additional questions or um, feel free to visit your website, marogian.com uh, to check out a hardcover or audiobook uh, of uh, 2030, how today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave us with today, Mauro? Uh, just uh, first of all, a word of thanks to you and to the technical team behind this and uh, all of the listeners because of their questions. And uh, once again, as you mentioned, I would very much like to continue the conversation. Reach out to me. The easiest way perhaps is uh, over LinkedIn. Uh, so just send me a request or you can also email me. And I would be very happy to continue with the conversation. And uh, remember, uh, we need now to think about what uh, the future may bring, especially the next 10 years, because I think they're going to be revolutionary. If you think the pandemic has changed everything, wait and see what's about to happen next. Great. Um, well, it's always a pleasure, Mauro. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us today and uh, best of luck. Thank you so much, Lisa.